Good evening, everybody. And uh, <clears throat> I, I am glad to see people here. I know the, it seems that the, uh, there's been an awful lot of, uh, uh, in the way of presentations and discussions on the whole RF exposure issue. And uh, I'm not here as an expert, although we have, uh, we have an expert with us uh, with Wayne N6NB. Uh, Wayne, thanks for joining us. And uh, please do chime in if you, uh, if you uh, hear something that needs to be corrected. Um, the the mechan this is not about the the mechanics of doing the calculations. Uh, what I did was I developed a little spreadsheet using the the simplified method or the quick method, if you will, really just for the purpose of doing what ifs. Uh, it's not as accurate as the uh, the formula based uh, work that uh, Wayne does. In fact, I'll show an example of this printout on his. Uh, on his uh, site, uh, but it does allow me to uh, move, uh, you know, move a parameter and then see how that affects everything. And it's pretty much as we could predict. So let's kind of go through it. I'll share my screen. All right, is the screen showing okay? Yes. All right, good, good. All right. So uh, as you probably heard by now, an RF exposure assessment is required whenever you make a change to a station or if you have not done one in the past. And in this case, if we're talking about setting up at a remote location for a fair or a race or some other you know, public service type event, Almost by definition, it's going to be a, a new configuration. However, uh, you'll find there are some commonalities that once you've worked this out, uh, the same will apply virtually wherever you are. Now, the assignment that you have uh, may vary considerably. If you're a net control, uh, you may find that you're transmitting very frequently, or if you're uh, providing bulletins or announcements uh, on a regular basis or you may even have multiple transmitters going on at a particular location. On the other hand, you may be at a checkpoint where you check in once every half hour, or if there's some uh, uh, you know, first runner coming or something like that, which means you're gonna be transmitting very little. Um, in some cases, you will be in an area where there are lots of the public close by, the public being non-hams, uh, we're consider that the uh, uncontrolled exposure in the, in the language of the, uh, of the regulations. And in other cases, you may be kind of by yourself and uh, not have very many people around. So all these things will affect a little bit uh, how close people are gonna get to your antenna and also uh, how much power you need to be able to get the job done because uh, you may have to reach a, a, you know, some distant point. Uh, typically we're gonna talk about uh, VHF and UHF here, not using HF uh, over very long distances. This is uh, two meters, 220, 440, typically running a mobile radio, 50 watts or less. Uh, we're not gonna be concerned about handhelds at this point because the rules are a bit different there and it's not really something that you can, um, that you can calculate on your own. So let's start with a typical, very simple installation where you really don't have any setup. You've got a uh, you've got a spike antenna on your roof, uh, you know, quarter wave whip, um, no real gain over a dipole. You're using the full 50 watts or whatever available on two meters. Uh, you may have people uh, coming up to your window and talking to you, um, or you know, or very nearby you. So that's the that's kind of the base case we're going to start with here. Now, again, this, this uh, spreadsheet that I set up is not really designed for coming up with an accurate result in terms of the RF exposure. Rather, it's to take the factors that lead you to the simplified method and then throwing in a few additional factors, mainly transmitting percentage of transmitting time and the duty cycle of whatever mode you're using. Of course, if we're using FM, it's 100%. Every time you key the mic, whether you're talking or not, the transmitter is uh, putting out full power. So in this case, we're using uh, two meters. And uh, when you look at the, uh, the near field calculation, 
it's like a foot and a half over just over a foot so i'm going to assume that somebody's standing next to you and you open your in your open car window so they're about three feet from your antenna um the simplified calculation again th this is the simplified calculations are very conservative uh you find yourself on the edge you simply go through the real calculations and most of the time you'll find that it's not as much of a problem. So the threshold there of uh, ERP is three watts when you have somebody three feet from the antenna uh, under the sim oops, under the simplified calculation. Now let's say you're using uh, you know 50 watt power. Uh, you've got uh, yeah, maybe a seven tenths of a dB. I just used some samples from my own installation. Uh, so you've got about 43 watts going out the antenna. Uh, the simplified method, unlike the the full calculation, uses gain over a dipole and a, a ground plane vertical is essentially similar gain to a dipole so there's no there's no uh, gain there to be included so you've got roughly 43 watts effective radiated power uh, at three feet the simplified method suggests your threshold's about three watts well clearly uh that's a that could be a problem um even uh, now when you transmit uh let's say you're transmitting a third of the time, which is fairly busy. Uh, so your, your uh, mode factor and your, uh, that would basically get you to a, a third of that uh, 43 or about 14 watts ERP, which still appears to be above the threshold in the simplified case. So that suggests that maybe we need to change something. And of course, if you consider that the rooftop antenna is basically right at head level for somebody who's standing next to you. So I, I used uh, uh, Wayne N6NB's calculator for this same set of facts, and it came out uh, at three feet, the estimated power density is uh, 0.22 watt milliwatts per square centimeter. And of course, the limit for uncontrolled environments, uh, our, our environment is, ourselves, it isn't a problem, the controlled environment, because the limits, uh, one milliwatt, so we're well below that. But the uncontrolled for the public is 0.2 milliwatts. So we're just over the edge there in terms of the actual calculation. And it says, well, you'd be okay if you keep them 3.2 feet away instead of three feet. That's kind of the, that's, that's your minimum, if you will. But uh, just looking at the uh, possible ways to change that, obviously you could try and keep people further away from your vehicle. But that may be out of your control. You may have to be, you know, next to a an aid station or something, and you you can't you you can't mark off your own real estate and keep people away. Um, it may be a very crowded situation where there's no way you could keep people from uh, being right near you. Um, you could transmit for less time, but that may not be consistent with the assignment you have. You may you have to call when you have to call. And uh, you may or may not be in a situation to be able to reduce your transmit time. You could lower your transmit power. Uh, uh, that could help, but again, it, it could affect your ability to reach that, that distant station if you really need all 50 watts. If you don't need the 50 watts, you shouldn't be using it. And with the idea is lowest power necessary to get the job done. Uh, so you could easily drop it down to half and, and be fine, but that may not always be the case. And there's another solution that is mount the antenna higher so that it's not right where everybody's standing. So let's rework this scenario. Um, and instead of a rooftop spike, let's use a typical uh, small gain vertical Comet, Comet GP3, uh, stick it on top of a 14 foot mast. So the closest anybody's going to get to it is eight feet straight below. You know, they're six feet tall, 14 feet. There's your there's your eight feet. And uh, this thing has a published gain of 4.5 dBi, but since the simplified method uses uh, decibels over dipole, you'd subtract 2.15. So we get 2.35 dB over dipole. Now, when we plug that in, it looks, oh gosh, just using the simplified method again, which is very conservative, we're kind of right at the limit. Okay. We see that our, uh, our, our, threshold power for this simplified method has gone from three watts to 23. Why? Well, we got more distance. Okay, you're not three feet away, you're eight feet away. And remember the, the uh, RF field intensity goes down as the square of the, dis as the, square of the distance away uh, from the source. 
uh, still transmitting the same power. You got a couple of dB that would seem to put you above the threshold. However, you have to consider where that gain is. Okay, um, I looked through the literature and the advertising for uh, Comet and Diamonds and some other uh, similar base antennas, you know, from the from the short ones to the really long ones, and couldn't find any vertical radiation patterns. So I called the Comet factory and I asked to talk to the engineers. And I said, do you have anywhere in your test data the vertical radiation patterns? That is the, you know, looking sideways, if you will, with, with this horizon on the axis, center axis, um, for your GP3 and similar antennas. And they sent me, they found it, they sent me the uh, vertical radiation patterns for the GP3, 6, 9, and 12. So I took that, and I, you see it has two, two curves on it. Uh, the green one is for two meters, and this is a dual band antenna. The red one is for 70 centimeters. And of course, you see the 70 centimeter pattern is a lot flatter because, of course, they have more segments uh, on 70 meters, 70 meters than they do on uh, two meters. So what do these rings mean? <clears throat> well, the outside of the ring is basically your published gain, your maximum gain. And we said that was about two and a half dB, okay? As you go in the first ring, it's uh, 3 dB down. You, the next one is 6 dB down. Next one's 12 dB down. <clears throat> so look what happens when you're right below it. Uh, and this is true of most ground plane verticals. There's virtually no radiation going straight down or straight up, which is good. I mean, functionally, that's what you want. You don't want to waste power going to the ground or going up straight up. You want it as close to the horizon as you can get it. So the person down here is way, way below uh, the published gain. It's negative gain, uh, negative by about 15 dB. Okay, what happens if you start moving out a little bit? Well, you've added a little bit of distance and you have a little less pattern attenuation. Uh, you're maybe at uh, eight or nine dB down from the published gain now. Now, what happens if you move out to the side? This curve is getting out here, but now you got 16 feet. So you've, you've got like one fourth of the field density just on distance alone. And you still have negative gain from that pattern. You're, you know, you're down maybe uh, you know, five dB or so from the, from the two and a half uh, dBD that, we, that is published. So let's see how this affects everything. All right, so we have our same, same near field calculation. Um, our distance is eight feet. So that gives you a threshold of uh, 23 watts. You're still put, putting out your 50 watts, uh, but now of course you have a little longer coax. So maybe the loss has gone up to one dB. So you got about 40 watts going out the antenna. The gain in the direction of the person standing underneath it is probably much less than minus 12 dB. We just took this as a, as a guideline, okay? And when you apply that, your effective radiated power is very, very low in the direction of the person standing underneath it, way below. So basically, it, even if you're transmitting 100% of the time, with the antenna up there and the gain pointed away from people's heads instead of toward it, um, this is not going to be enough RF to do anything, no matter how much you transmit. Even if you increased your power significantly, it wouldn't matter. How about for the person standing a foot or so away? Well, uh, threshold's gone up a little bit because the distance has gone up. Uh, you still have negative gain. It's the, you know, say uh, nine or minus nine or 10 dB down from the plus two and a half. So you're around minus seven. Again, the effective radiated power in the direction of that person is extremely low and well below the threshold. So even if you don't take into account, you're transmitting less than 100% of the time. If you do, it's even lower. How about the person standing out there at 16 feet away? Okay, well now look at your threshold. Because of the distance, the threshold is you know 80 watts EIRP. Um, you're only transmitting 40 watts. So right at the get-go, uh, 
you're well below that threshold. Uh, you're still in negative gain territory. You know, you're about, uh, you have two and a half minus about five. So you're still around minus two dB, 25 watts, well below the threshold. And then when you consider in the percentage of time, you're transmitting even less. So basically, once you get that antenna up away from people, it doesn't matter really how much power you're running. It doesn't matter uh, how much uh, you're transmitting. There's just there's no way you're going to get even close to the uh, you know to the the threshold. Okay, so why? Because the height adds distance, and the gain is directed away from people. Now they say, okay, that's fine, but I can't use a vertical. I have to. I've got a long distance to cover, and I'm going to I'm going to use a five element Yagi. Okay, well that's fine. So I pulled a typical, this is a diamond five element, two meter Yagi. Now the pattern they normally give you is, uh, these things are normally used for sideband work and so on. And so they're used in a horizontal plane. And so they give you this top down look at the radiation pattern. Well, if you turn it on its side, the pattern goes on its side too. It's gonna be a little like this. Okay, you're gonna make it, you're gonna have it set up uh, with vertical polarization at the top of that mast. And you can see even now, uh, you're, you're well below, you know, minus 30 dB, minus 21 dB in this direction. Even you get out to 16 feet, you're like 4 dB below published. So um, you've got all the advantages of negative gain, if you will, gain away from people, just like you would with a vertical that's elevated. The feed points up here, this is all, you know, eight feet above people's heads about 16 feet, about 15 feet, 14 feet above the ground. So let's look at 70 centimeters. Uh, well, will we have the same problem with a rooftop antenna? So again, these are very conservative. Uh, if you run Wayne's calculation, you'll find that even this is fine. Uh, you're, you're below the threshold, even if they're uh, you know three or four feet away. Um, in this case, um, Again, the near field is very small. So say you're uh, four feet away, um, you've got uh, anything uh, below eight watts and you're automatically uh, clear from the simplified calculations. Uh, typically the mobile radios put out a little less on uh, 70 centimeters than they do on two meters just because the solid state devices that do the amplification are a little less efficient. You got a little more uh, feed line loss. So let's say you've got maybe 30 watts going out to the antenna. Again, quarter wave spike, no gain. Uh, uh, you're putting a, about 30 watts uh, out effective radiated power at the feed point. When you factor in the, uh, the uh, percentage of time that you're going to transmit, you know, it's still, it's kind of close. Again, if you go through the detailed Wayne calcs, you'll find that uh, you're fine, even in this scenario. But uh, again, the purpose of this is just to do a quick and dirty to say, am I even close? Am I way over? Am I way under? So we can do the same thing with the uh, uh, GP3. Uh, now on that one, it's got more gain, uh, which is about uh, 5 dBd over a dipole that is, but you remember that flat pattern? It's really away from all the people. It's very much pointed toward the horizon. Uh, look at, you know, on two meters, you had, uh, what about uh, maybe five dB attenuation uh, uh, out of this angle. Here you've got like 12 dB attenuation. So you know that getting that antenna up in the air is going to give you even lower exposure to anybody on the ground, whether they're underneath it or 10, 20 feet away or anywhere in between. You know, unless they're, unless they're uh, sitting up on the roof of their, uh, of their uh, tour bus and they're right looking right into the bore side of your antenna, um, you're not going to be able to get anything close. So when you run the numbers, I mean, look, we're you know, the threshold for uh, a distance of eight feet standing right below you is uh, 34 watts uh, ERP. 
uh, you're not even putting out that much. And when you consider the negative gain of the antenna, you're down to a water tube at the most that's coming down toward people. So you're way, way below any possible problem. So what do we learn from all this? Again, these are not exact calculations, but it really allows us to play with the numbers a little bit <clears throat> and see how things change. Obviously, lowering your power can help, but that's linear. You know, you cut half the power, you get half the exposure. Uh, distance is better because with the inverse square wave law, uh, when you go twice the distance, you get only a quarter of the exposure. So it falls off, you know, uh, as the square of the distance. Height is really your best friend because when you couple it with antenna gain, the power that's being radiated is away from people. And what is going down toward people is way, way, way below. I mean, orders of magnitude below the actual nominal power that's going out the antenna. Now, if you're gonna put something up in the air, a couple of safety things you need to remember. First, uh, make sure that uh, mast is guyed or otherwise secured so it doesn't fall onto people. We had a problem at uh, Baker to Vegas uh, at our stage where uh, one of our members brought a mast with a, an antenna on the top. It was about 25, 30 feet, very tall, and it worked great, but he had short legs on the base, so there wasn't much leverage, and even with the sandbags on it, we had some huge wind gusts, and it blew the thing over, and you know, the antenna bonked a little girl on the head. Fortunately, it wasn't very heavy, but that's not something you want to do. So you have to, you know, tie it to your, uh, you know, flag it to your, tie it to your vehicle or your easy up or whatever. Make sure you have everything uh, secured. In my case, I have a uh, front a hitch receiver on my vehicle as well as a rear one. And I have a fixture made up so that I can put a mast on that front hitch receiver. And it, it if the, if the vehicle doesn't blow over, the mast isn't going to blow over. And I can get it up there easily. And it's, there's no, no loose wires, no uh, ropes or anything else to get in people's way. Uh, if you do have uh, guy lines or, or you know, stringing a cable across the vehicle, make sure you flag them. Flagging tape is cheap. It's that high visibility plastic, uh, you know, yellow or, or orange or whatever, green. Uh, cut a bunch of lengths of that off and tie it so that it's very obvious where it is to reduce the chance that people are gonna walk into it. Um, try to make sure you locate all your hardware out of the path uh, of pedestrians and other vehicles. And obviously a uh, key point, if you're gonna put anything up in the air above the vehicle, look up, make sure there are no power lines anywhere in the area, uh, either directly above you or where the thing might tilt over and hit them. So, that's pretty much it. And uh, I will undo the screen share here if I can. And let's go back to uh, taking questions and getting some discussion. Good show, Marty. Hi, Wayne. Thank you. Good to see you. Comments? Love your show. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, you know, since you uh, you really have developed the, the definitive tool, um, any any further suggestions in that regard? I know you've you've done tests with uh, more power than I was talking about. No, I I agree completely with all of your conclusions. Uh, I watched, and uh, I, the only thing I'd add is homeowners associations ought to set limit minimum height limits not maximum height limits. Well, you're not kidding. And, and on HF, which we didn't really delve into here, that is even more important. Uh, you know, a, a, a kilowatt and a three element Yagi, you know, at second floor level is really much worse than a kilowatt and a three element Yagi that's 60 feet up. Yeah. Uh, again, point the gain away from people, not toward people. Yeah, in my slideshow, there's an example uh, with a meter like the new one you have, I don't know if you're going to talk about your meter, but you now have a fancy Rayham meter, and I've got a slide using one of those, and on a sidewalk, you're over the limit uh, with a uh, with a 10-meter beam in the backyard. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, that's the kind of problem you run into. Yeah, and uh, uh, unfortunately, when you start trying to model uh, or calculate, remember all these calculations are estimates, okay? Nothing takes the place of measurement. And when you're trying to model where you are relative to the end of a, of a uh, you know, a, an a, yes, a, you know, a long uh, dipole, like an 80 meter dipole or something, um, you can't really model that effectively. So at some point you can, you can do some estimates, but if you're running some power, the chance that you're going to fall below the uh, quickie thresholds is not very good. And so you're really gonna have to do some measurements. Uh, the, the meter that uh, Wayne refers to is uh, RAHAM, which stands for uh, Radiation Hazard Meter. It's US made. And I found a used one. Uh, it needed a little TLC, but I've seemed to have it working. And so we uh, are going to do some experimenting with that and actual measurements. Uh, HF, of course, is, is where it will come in very useful. But also, uh, there have been models that show that uh, RF inside a vehicle, if you're running enough power, depending on where you have the antenna, like if you some people use a trunk lid mount, uh, well, the feed point is looking right in the back window, <laughs> okay? And I'm not sure that is necessarily the best place to have an antenna if you're gonna run 50 watts or so. And so it will be interesting to uh, test this sort of thing. Uh, I understand the league actually has the really high quality NARDA, uh, mo you know, uh, RF exposure meter, but uh, they haven't really run tests. I, I thought it would be good to just get some volunteers to run tests on the vehicles in the parking lot at the ARL headquarters with all those folks with the mobile rigs, but they haven't done that. So we may undertake to do some of that maybe as uh, part of an ARIES or ACS project or something and uh, indicate, you know, show people what the results are. And especially with mag mounts, you can put antennas different places and then do some measurements and, uh, and see what you get. But I'm looking forward to doing some experiments with that and comparing with the results you've had so far, Wayne. We got a question in the chat. Okay, uh, I can't see the chat right now, so. Okay, what do, you, what do you have to do, what do you have to have at a site to prove that we are in the safe zone with people around? Well, uh, the, the best is to have a uh, calculation like the one that I showed that, that blue slide with, uh, with Wayne's calculator, because that's, that's been approved by the FCC uh, to be consistent with the uh, regulations. And now you can't do anything about somebody who insists that anything, even the, even the stuff that the FCC considers safe is still bad. I mean, you can't fix that. However, uh, by having adequate documentation for each of the bands you use, for each of the, uh, <clears throat> uh, each of the uh, configurations of your station, and you can show in each case below the threshold, below the threshold, below the threshold, um, that would do it. Now, I got an interesting request from uh, one of our ECS members who uh, is going to help. He's helping a community up in the hills uh, in the Santa Monica Mountains, and he's got permission to put a repeater up on the steeple of a local church. Now, right across the street is a school, and they're concerned about, well, how much RF is going down to that school? So I, I took some calculations. I, you know, I got some uh, maps and did some scale drawings, did some trigonometry uh, to the extent I can to figure out the uh, slant distance and so on, and looked again at the radiation pattern of the antenna to figure out what was going to be down there, and it was way, way, way below any thresholds. But all people have to see is there's a red circle, and even if the red circle says, you know, uh, 0.001, it says, oh, that circle's touching my school. So, uh, you're going to have to consider how you present it and uh, how you uh, educate the people who are concerned. One possibility would be to have a uh, anything below the threshold, you know, I would display it in green, for example, the safe zone. And, and uh, that way, it's not just a continuing fall off of reds. It's all of a sudden you're in the green, you're in the safe zone. Uh, that to me would be probably a, a more easily saleable presentation uh, than one that just had numbers. Okay. Larry said, don't use red in your presentation. In yeah, your I, would use, use I would use yellow, yellow and okay. then turn it to green. Yep. 
Uh, okay. Uh, David wants to know where they can get the RF calculator from online, I guess. Uh, that would be uh, the, the, the really accurate one. You go to N6NB, November 6, November Bravo.com. Uh, go down along the left side to RF safety and you click it there. And not only will you get a great history of how these things developed, uh, but also there will be a link to the calculator um, and you can download that calculator, keep it on your computer and run it whenever you need to. Okay, and Dan WL7COO wants to know, isn't the RF ray front radiating from the tip of the vertical antenna donut shaped RF Fresnel zone that emanates from the tip of the vertical antenna? Well, it's, no. The, the current, the current, most of the current actually flows at the at the base, right out, right off the feed point. Uh, the the tip is kind of a high voltage point, and as far as Fresnel zones, uh, we're talking about being too close for that to even matter. I mean, you know, if somebody's three feet away, the Fresnel zone is inapplicable. Okay, that's all the questions so far. Hey, and uh, up there and. Uh... So Southern Cal has got his hand up. I took a look there. Dan, bring your hand back up. Hello, D, Dan. Hello? Well, I, well, I was just going to sort of refine what I wrote because I couldn't manage to type it correctly after an IPA triple 11% beer. <laughs> Go ahead, Dan. No, that, that's just it. I mean, so all of the um, coverage plotting I'm familiar with, which is mostly for um, um, very high frequencies for wireless internet service provider radios, mm -hmm. Fresnel zone has a distinct shape. And I've always understood, perhaps incorrectly, that on a vertical quarter wave, mounted on top of a vehicle, the actual coverage is defined by a donut shaped wavefront. And I wasn't aware that it emanated from the feed point. And I, I, you know, I'm pretty sure that, um, well, I guess with the microwave radios, the, 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 the face of the antenna and the feed point aren't very far apart, but, um, you know, for VHF, I, I always assumed that uh, something at nine feet was going to go over the heads of anybody standing around the vehicle or in the vehicle. Yeah, it probably will. Uh, uh, again, the, you, know, you remember those patterns we were showing for the free space uh, of, the, uh, of the comet. Um, you know, it, it falls off as you, uh, <clears throat> as you go from straight horizontal. Now, is it horizontal from the feed point or the tip of the antenna? Well, pro I think I, I'm not a I'm not a physicist, but I know that I, I would worry most about the uh, the high current point. But on a two meter antenna, what's the difference? I mean, you're talking, you know, it's it's 19 inches long, so you're going to be eight inches up from the base. It's still right about at people's heads. Uh, well, okay, most of the you know dual band antennas you see on vehicles are more on the order of three feet. Um, so there'll be, you know, so gain that antennas. That might give you some extra separation, yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> well, again, uh, okay, I, would, just, I, would, I would go to the, I would go to the uh, um, published or if you can get it, unpublished uh, specifications and, and measurements from the folks who designed the antenna and uh, look, look at the vertical radiation pattern. And that'll pretty much tell you, you know, again, whether it's, I, I would say at that point, it's probably halfway up the antenna. Can but, I ask uh, a favor of you that you go ahead and take your high dollar gizmo and put it at the feet point of a gain antenna on the roof of your car and then step up on a step ladder. So <laughs> you're somewhere between the tip of the antenna and where the donut. <laughs> So he says, go, go irradiate yourself. <laughs> yeah. No, Actually, no, no, that's no. Probably, go stick, that's go a good stick idea. Your, go stick no, that, your gizmo in that's it. That's a good measure. idea. Yeah. Okay. If I had one, I'd just not say anything and come back in a few weeks or months when we had this conversation again. Excellent. Yeah, good idea. I will do that. Thank you, sir. Other questions, comments, suggestions? 
Uh, I have a question. Loretta, hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for doing this. Um, for field day, I have one of those Radio Jove kits. Um, it's a, it's a, it's two dipoles. It's only about ten feet up. Um, it's just for picking up uh, radio signals from from like Jupiter and the Sun and whatnot. Uh, we're not transmitting on it. So the only thing I have to worry about, right, is is flagging all the guy lines. And, if we're if not you're not transmitting, it, then it's tr simply, uh, you know, physical, physical safety, mechanical safety. Yeah, we're not transmitting. It's just a receiving thing. That'll be so interesting. I, yeah, so I don't have to worry about uh, any radiation points for people right not not when you're not transmitting oh, okay uh, that does bring up a good point though in the, the field day the situation typically where we have antennas that tend to be mounted low because of the available supports and now normally we're running only 100 watts for most field stations so the power issue isn't quite as much but remember the the uh you know the the near fields are much bigger at uh, 40 and 80 meters than they are at two meters. So um, that's gonna be, in fact, I'm planning to bring my meter and when we set up for field day uh, at, uh, for ACS, and it's gonna be mostly wire antennas and I'm gonna be probing around to see what the fields look like at, at various locations around the antennas. Yeah, it, 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 in my experience with a little bit of training and job hazard analysis, a field day. I don't know that I've ever seen an actually safe field day site. <laughs> non, you know, amateur radio operators, uh, trip hazards and, you know, emanations, um, exhaust from generators. God forbid they're not converted to solar yet. Um, things like that. I, I just it amazes me what we get away with. Well, and and. One of the reasons I think ARRL uh, changed the rules a few years ago uh, to include a bonus for safety officers because they want everybody to have one and they gave you a sample checklist and that checklist is fairly comprehensive. And now, of course, you may need to include six foot separation masks and so on, depending on where you are. But uh, that checklist does include, uh, you know, minimization and flagging of uh, trip and fall hazards uh, marking of barriers, uh, using uh, barrier tape. Uh, the spot that we've used for ACS is a, uh, uh, a field next to a fire station up on Mulholland Drive, which can see down to the LA Basin and up in the valley and points north, uh, but it has a helipad on it. So our VHF stuff's up on a helipad, but if you go too far to the edge, it just falls off down under the road, uh, you know, 30 feet below. So we have, we have barriers set up and barrier tape to make sure <laughs> And we give everybody a safety briefing before the event starts and make sure everybody understands what hazards we know about that they should avoid and that they should call out any hazard they see that we may have missed or any unsafe situation. So uh, you're making me ask, will ARRL accumulate reports of injuries of any kind at field day sites? I in seriously order, doubt in order it. to have some real information to share that would minimize that. There, there, there is no reporting mechanism that I know of, but I think that would be an excellent idea considering you've got, uh, what, probably in the high hundreds to thousand, low thousands of stations out there. And uh, nope. that, that's, a, that's a wide enough array of, of, uh, of uh, people and capabilities and knowledge and setups that uh, you're probably going to have some issues, um, and I, yeah, cooler I would, full, cooler, I would really cooler, support that. Cooler full of beers within arm distance of anyone operating the station is an automatic fail. Well, <laughs> you know, uh, we we of course we're on a fire station property, so we can't use alcohol. But I remember um, my my early field days were with the West, called the West Valley Amateur Radio Club. We were all kids, you know, high school and college kids. There were no adults in the club. We used to go out and win nationally 4A every year. Uh, I mean, we did it like six years. We were the top in the nation in that score. Very, very competitive. And a bunch of these guys are now in the CQ Contest Hall of Fame and so on. So we were a serious bunch. 
And you imagine on a hot summer weekend up in the mountains, a bunch of teenage boys, no alcohol. We were there to do a job, absolutely no alcohol. And that was the rule and everybody stuck to it. Okay, let's, uh, let's pick up somebody else here, Victor. Go ahead, Victor. Thank you. This is valuable information. I got my ticket in 2014 and I am nowhere near being electrician, electronic expert, a hobbyist. I can't use a solder gun to uh, save my life. This is all foreign stuff to me. I see the charts at field day at Washington Salmon Run, uh, 7QP. It still does not make sense to me, but I have an advantage over a lot of people. I'm in the organization, I'm learning, I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to understand. So many people don't. They come by, they pass us by, they they well, are they are where I was before I became a, an operator. They have no idea. You, you know, you, you put yourself in a situation where you're going to learn stuff every day. And especially if you're working in a group, one of the nice things about field day, I mean, I, I understand the, the reasons for doing the distributed field day entries as they did for the last couple of years, and that's still available. But one of the advantages of working in the group is you get to go with people who've done this before. And especially if you're setting up ahead of time, which I strongly recommend, you can take the time to show somebody, get them involved, show them how to do it, explain why you're doing it, point out the safety issues, point out the reliability and mechanical issues, and uh, you can leave them a lot more knowledgeable at the end of that weekend than they were when they first came. So uh, absolutely take part in all these things. Everything you do in ham radio contributes to everything else you do in ham radio. Things you learn on a de-expedition, you can apply in MCOM. Uh, you know, things you, things you learn climbing a tower, you can use in a portable field situation. You get an appreciation for some of the electrical issues, the mechanical issues, even without formal training in those areas. Um, I, know, I know folks who will hire a ham over a uh, recent college graduate because the ham has had practical experience. The college graduate hasn't. Right, right. And, and I appreciate all that. My concern is more for that person who has not yet become an operator, has no intention of becoming an operator, and they're looking at this chart and they have no idea what it means because- Okay, well then, then uh, they, there's stuff. a little bit of an education job to do there. Yeah. And again, you the way you present it can can uh, make give them a warm fuzzy feeling or have them concerned depending on how you do it. So uh, I think, uh, you know, presentation is a lot of it. Once you've done the basic calcs and the basic homework, you know what the answer is. Now it's just a matter of, uh, putting it to them in a way that will make sense for them. And you may have to simplify things a little bit. You don't start talking about DVD versus DBI and so on. That's gobbledygook to the average layperson. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, put it in as simple a terms as you can. I've been guilty myself of my wife says, somebody asked me what time it is. I tell them how to make a watch. Okay. Right, and right. we've probably all done that to some extent because we enjoy the knowledge that we have, uh, however much or little we happen to have and we kind of get wrapped up in it, but most people aren't wrapped up in it. So uh, we have to dial it down and try to find a plain language uh, means of delivering what we need to deliver. Just so long as that one fuzzy feeling doesn't come off the end of an antenna. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, anybody else with anything? Well, Larry's got his hand up. Take it away, Larry. Larry. Hey, Larry. Uh, when you're doing your data gathering, are you going to keep a record of which kind of antennas are being used? Oh yeah, there's so no point. There's no point if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse yeah. me. Uh, are you going to polish it? Uh, polish it. <laughs> are you going to publish it? Uh, well, let's see what sorts of results I get, and and whether if I if I get the time, yes, because that information can be useful to other people. So uh, I mean, that's one of the reasons I do talks like this is. Uh, you know, just because I figured something out or at least got some ideas that may help someone, if I don't share it, uh, you know, it stops with me. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, I, I really appreciate what you're doing, sir. 
really appreciate you coming out with this. Uh, it's a lot of times it's stuff that we know about, but we don't think about. What we think about- M M Marty, can you give the uh, website again? Someone said they tried it and it came back as a bad website that was dangerous. Wayne, you can unmute and address that. Well, um, I think there are certifications um, that I, my, my uh, web host is godaddy.com and uh, they are pretty careful. I mean, I don't think they have all the certifications for every one of their uh, sites that they host, but they are very careful about, about what what's on there. And, and yes, my site is safe. In6nb.com has never had a virus on it, as far as I know. And I, I've used it as recently as last week. And uh, I yes, you get the warning. You just say, you know, you click it, say, show me more, and then send it anyway, and you'll be just fine. You'll end up with a nice working program in your download section, and then you don't have to go back on the web. You can use it to your heart's content. Okay, that should do. I just went into it and it works okay for me. So there got to be some setting on his computer that's not right. Yeah, well, I got the same warning, but it just is it it's it it's a, some sort of uh, you know precautionary warning. But it really there is no there is no issue there. Don't worry about it. <laughs> for that site. For that site, yeah. Okay, looking for more hands. None. What do you see in the chat there, Barry? Tom has another question. You may have covered this already, but can you tell me what would make an area controlled for SDC purposes? Um, Wayne may be able to answer that better than I can. Basically, people uh, they they look they look at this more from a work standpoint, occupational exposure, uh, and if you and your family members are the ones that. Uh, have access to it. it presumably you've explained to your family members what you're doing uh they know that you're transmitting the person walking along the sidewalk uh who isn't looking up at an antenna may not know you're transmitting so it's people who are aware of what's going on versus people who aren't people who are aware can take steps to uh, minimize their own exposure hey let me know when you get on 80 meters with that kilowatt i'm not going to stand near the end of the antenna OK, but uh, if, if if somebody's walking along the sidewalk, they have no idea whether there's RF, what they're supposed to do. Uh, you know, it's up to you to protect them. It's not up to them to protect them. 